In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. But what if we considered the Word not merely as speech, but as sound, as vibration? Everything is music. That is something I've heard a couple of times, or we didn't invent music, we discovered it. It's as if the specific frequency, rhythm, or mathematical composition of music were already encoded in the universe, waiting to be found. And uh, in a sense, this is true. Everything is music. Everything is built upon atoms, which form molecules that in turn either become liquids, solids, or gases. Every atom vibrates, and every system of atoms vibrates in unison. And so, everything naturally resonates at a certain frequency, just as music. The common perception of a particle is that of a tiny dot or a minuscule sphere. Consider an atom, for example. We are often presented with this depiction of its structure. A small sphere, the nucleus, at the center, orbited by smaller spheres or dots, referred to as electrons. We use this model because it's straightforward and it works for computations and predictions. For this, we can point our fingers at mathematicians to them, particles represent coordinates in space with properties such as direction, velocity, spin, mass, and energy. However, in actuality, particles are not that, shall we say, physical. A particle is a coordinate in space that carries energy. But what is this energy, and how does this thing carry or contain it? And if you're like me, you probably listen to renowned minds like Brian Cox, Neil deGrasse Tyson, or even Sean Carroll. You've likely stumbled upon the fascinating dilemma of the observer effect. It basically posits this. When you observe, or more accurately, when you measure or interact with a particle, only then does it become a particle. Prior to that, it exists as a wave, more specifically, a wave function. Let's think about it like this. When you play a computer game and see a mountain, it's there. If you look away, the mountain is still there, right? Well, not exactly. The game essentially deletes that object to save processing power. If you turn back, the game reactivates those pixels and all the associated information. The observer effect suggests that our universe operates in a similar manner, dealing with the very fundamentals of our reality particles. Back to the mathematical point of view. A particle is just a concept, a coordinate in space with properties. These properties are in a state of superposition until they've been interacted with. Interaction can occur when you observe something, because observation requires photons and light particles to bounce off an object and return to your retina. Superposition essentially means that the particle has a probability of being in a particular location, possessing a certain amount of energy, and so on. But none of these qualities are determined until the moment of observation. Prior to this, the particle exists simply as a wave function. It's like nothing waiting to be something. To further grasp what a particle truly is, I like to imagine it this way. Think of an infinite, perfectly still ocean. 
In this metaphor, a photon, or light particle, is represented as a water droplet. When you observe a point on this ocean, a droplet springs up, touching the surface and creating a ripple. If you shift your gaze to another point, a new ripple forms there. The particle you perceive is essentially a field of these vibrations or oscillations, much like the rings created by the droplets. While these ripples appear to have boundaries and behave in a certain way, they are not things in a traditional sense. They are simply areas of the ocean, the fabric of space vibrating or oscillating, creating patterns of ripples with differing frequencies. In my interpretation, everything in the universe is essentially the fabric of space vibrating at various frequencies. So a particle is merely the epicenter of an event, and in reality, there's nothing physically there. With this new understanding of particles in mind, let's return to the phrase, everything is music. Indeed, it's true that at the core of all matter, everything is vibrating. Whether it's you, me, a table, or the air we breathe, everything consists of atoms, and these atoms are in constant motion. They oscillate, they spin, they bond with other atoms to form molecules. All these movements generate characteristic frequencies. It's like each atom or molecule is playing its own little tune in the grand symphony of the universe. Considering the weird reality of particles that we just covered, why and how are things solid, fluid or gaseous? Why do certain configurations of atoms form specific molecules? which then creates cells, tissues, and eventually living organisms. It all boils down to the rules of physics, particularly quantum mechanics. Quantum entanglement is a fundamental principle in quantum mechanics, and it profoundly shapes our understanding of reality. It refers to a phenomenon where two or more particles become intrinsically linked, and the state of one directly influences the state of the other no matter the distance separating them. This spooky action at a distance, as Einstein called it, is one of the ways that quantum mechanics diverges from classical physics. Particles, until they are observed or measured, exist in what is known as a superposition of states. Essentially, they exist in all possible states at once. It's only when we observe or measure them that they collapse into a single state. This has led to the famous concept of Schrödinger's cat, which is both alive and dead until observed. Now, when particles become entangled, this measurement or observation of one instantly determines the state of its entangled partner, even if they are light years apart. For me, this doesn't say, hey, particles can teleport, or particles can communicate with some medium that pushes information instantly, faster than the speed of light. It is very clear to me that when we investigate the details or foundation of reality itself, we come to find out that we are looking at something that isn't three-dimensional. We are measuring and getting information in three dimensions. But we might be looking at something as complex as a nine or ten-dimensional shape. These principles don't just apply to isolated particles in a lab. They also govern how atoms join together to form molecules. In fact, quantum entanglement plays a key role in many biological systems. Some researchers believe it may even play a role in processes like photosynthesis and our sense of smell. Therefore, the behavior of matter, the formation of complex systems, and even life itself are deeply intertwined with these peculiar quantum phenomena. In essence, we live in a universe that's not just a symphony of oscillating atoms and molecules, but also a grand dance of quantumly entangled particles. This suggests that at the most fundamental level, everything around us and within us is deeply interconnected and vibrantly alive in its own quantum way. So, quantum entanglement kind of explains why something that appears to be a wave, or almost nothing, uh, until measured or interacted with, can be something. Like a table. It is there because of 
all its atoms are entangled with each other, basically. So, everything is vibrating, and the frequencies that, quote, work, they become particles, which in turn will have other physical laws that decide the next system, like a planet uh, or whatever. Just as a tune sounds good or rhythms feel good, instead of just chaotic sounds mashed together. Is there anything to learn or take from this? Well, a couple of years ago, researchers from the University of Sao Paulo in Brazil and Heritwatt University in Edinburgh, UK, in 2018, gave us one idea about the implications of this knowledge. But before we leap into the discoveries and how they could revolutionize our world, let's touch on some basics of sound and how frequencies interact. For instance, when two identical sound waves are perfectly out of phase, that is, one wave's peak aligns with the other's trough, or as I like to call it, valley, they cancel each other out. This phenomenon is called destructive interference. It's a prime example of how frequencies can interact, not just to create, but also to negate. With these principles in mind, let's turn the page to our next chapter, a chapter filled with intriguing experiments the art and science of cymatics, and the limitless possibilities that arise when we harness the power of sound. Imagine vehicles levitating with ease off the ground, or a world powered by boundless clean energy. It might sound like science fiction, but as we'll explore, these could be the melodies of our not-so-distant future. With the understanding of the principles of destructive interference and the researchers' work in 2018, we can begin to appreciate the extent of the possibilities. The primary challenge, as we can imagine, is determining the exact frequency at which an object, or more specifically, the atoms in an object, vibrate. It's that the atoms are jiggling. If they jiggle more, it corresponds to hotter, and colder is jiggling less. So if you have a uh, a bunch of atoms, a cup of coffee or something, sitting uh, on a table. And the atoms are jiggling a great deal in the coffee, and they bounce against the cup, and the cup then gets shaking, and the atoms in the cup shake, and they bounce against the saucer, and the heat heats the cup and heats everything else. And hot thing spreads its heat into other things by mere contact, because the atoms that are jiggling a lot in the hot thing shake the ones that are jiggling. Quantum mechanics teaches us that every particle has a unique wave function, which describes the particle's state, including its energy and momentum. This wave function can be thought of as a vibration, much like a musical note. Everything from the tiniest subatomic particle to the largest celestial body has its unique notes in the cosmic orchestra. Its unique wave function, and thus, its unique vibration. While well, we've already developed sophisticated technologies to determine the frequencies of some particles, such as electrons in atoms, the challenge lies in determining the frequencies of more complex systems, like large molecules or macroscopic objects. This hurdle is not insignificant. Complex systems are composed of countless particles, all interacting with each other, producing a symphony of frequencies that can be overwhelmingly intricate to decipher. When I say a complex system, I could be talking about something as basic as a table, or a rock, or anything that we can see with our own eyes. You know that atoms are tiny as hell, so a table, for instance, fits an enormous amount of atoms in it. In fact, a 1x1 one one meter table consists of approximately 6 times 10 to the power of 27 atoms. And if you would take every grain of sand on the entire planet, that number is only 7.5 times 10 to the power of 18. There are more than a million times atoms in a table than there are grains of sand on Earth. What I just wanted to say is that something as basic as a table is an extremely complex system. So to be able to match or calculate the frequency of that, which is changing every millisecond a bit, is an extremely hard task. However, as you may have noticed, things are moving exponentially fast nowadays much thanks to the advancements of AI, so these things may not be that far in the future. What I am interested in, though, is if these kinds of technologies, like acoustic levitation, 
and manipulation of matter through sound has been used in the past, specifically in ancient times. I'm talking the building of the pyramids or the Jupiter temple in Balbuk. What about all these divine and holy symbols found from every culture, mimicking fractal geometry that are the basis for the fabric of space, matter and cymatics? What about that secret project that Randall Carlson and his team has been working on, patented and set to release to the public soon, plasmoid technology and the use of sound? All this we shall try to answer in the next video, in part two of Everything is Sound. Anyways guys, I hope you enjoyed the video. Subscribe, like, comment and all that if you think we're worth it. And I shall see you in the next one.